Coming up on the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show, we're going to talk about good bugs in your garden and how to get them there. As well as composting. It's simple. Everyone can do it no matter where you live. We're also going to talk with horticulture expert, media expert, and National Garden Association representative, William Moss. As well as your garden questions and our garden answers. So tell your garden friends that Garden Radio is on the air because it all starts right now. You are tuned in to the only vegetable gardening radio show in Milwaukee with your host, Joey Baird, who grew up in the country but now lives closer to the city, and Hallie Baird, who has always been a city girl. Combined, they have over 25 years of gardening experience who believe in simple gardening practices. A gardener for all gardeners, founders of the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, where they created over 800 how-to garden videos to teach others how to grow more of what they eat. Join them for the next hour as they discuss vegetable gardening and more. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show right here on 860 AM WNOV and W293CX106.5. Wherever you may be listening, however you may be listening, whether those through those particular stations, the TuneIn app, the Simple Radio app, the Radio tab on the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com website, social media, or anywhere in between. We are live in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I am your host, Joy Barrett. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Barrett. There's a number of ways in which you can contact us through the program today and a number of great companies that make this program possible every Saturday morning. Nasala Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nasala is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it. Because if it's not Nasala Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nasala.com. And you can call in the program at any time during the show. You can certainly give us your questions. We're here for that. And you can do that by going to the ivyorganics.com hotline. The ivyorganics.com hotline, that's 414-444-5250. Ivy Organic 3-in-1 Plant Guard naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents. Protects newly installed plants and trees. Shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit, and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit ivorganics.com. And it's easy to use. As well as you can email us at twvgradio at gmail.com. You can also tweet us using hashtag TWVG. Those two means of communication can be done any time during the week. The WisconsinVegetableGardener.com is our website. You can find uh, 900 plus videos on that website as well as on the main page on the right-hand side, a new feature where you can just click on segmentations, audio and video of the radio show and the in-studio video is multi-camera uh, angles and the whole deal there. So uh, we, we got a lot of stuff to get into the show. But first, Holly, I want to make sure I want you to check something. Was yesterday National Drive Like an Idiot Day? Because I'm just, I'm just curious. Because Do you want me to Google that? No, well, oh. well, if I was, I, I feel very disappointed and missed out because I wanted to participate. Because three different occasions on uh, driving yesterday, uh, people acted like idiots. I don't know. Are you sure you weren't the idiot? No, 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 no. I waited five seconds after light turned green, horn, honked the horn, and then they brake checked me. So I drove around them. And somebody decided to use the side of the interstate while traffic was backed up with their flashers on and decided to use that as a, as a roadway. And then somebody didn't know how to keep in lane, so I motioned, like, pick a lane, and I got the finger. So that was, that was enjoyable. Well, it's warm out. Oh, is that, does that add to that the, the, the idiot, level of stupidity? The idiots come out. Oh, the idiots come mm-hmm. out. Okay. Well, I hope that's not you who I'm speaking about. Well, while we're on the topic of driving... Uh, you know, I don't care if you smoke. You can smoke all you want. Just don't use the, the roadway as an ashtray. We talk about, uh, th- there's a lot of programs on this station that talk about beautification of your neighborhood. People call in, hey, I want to keep my neighborhood pretty. Well, it starts with it's not throwing junk out of the car, the small stuff. If you want a, small, a clean neighborhood, don't throw your cigarette butts out. There's an ashtray in your car for a reason. If you want your city, I don't know if most ashtray, cars have ashtrays anymore. Well, they just flick it out, and you want your city to look nice, it starts with the small stuff. You want your country to look nice, it starts with the small stuff. Any, uh, even if you're not a smoker, teach your... Well, true. You know, maybe don't litter, don't throw and things it, out your car and, window. And I wish it was a wall where I could follow you home and smack you in the face because, for littering because apparently your mother didn't do that. Right, I, I or mean, you can teach your you know, kids not to litter. That would be important, too. That's your public service announcement for the day. Uh, let, let's, get into, uh, let's get into something that we can all enjoy, which is good bugs in our garden. And there's a list of good bugs. 
now let's go with the, there's we talked about bad bugs this a couple of weeks ago and that's on the website and on the the segment uh, portion on the website. But good bugs. If you have good bugs and you have bad bugs, you have a balanced ecosystem, and you don't have to do a whole lot. You don't have to add or use chemicals to control bugs. Now the thing with chemicals, whether they're organic, inorganic, whatever, they're they're not they're not selected. They will kill everything that they come in contact with. There is not a, an insect repellent out there or, or a, a bad bug that's strictly focused on one specific insect. It, it affects a lot of bugs when you use an insecticide on your garden. So let's go about these good bugs. And some of you know some of these good bugs, and some of these may be new. The, the common everybody knows is the ladybug. That's number one. Now, you don't want to get the ladybug confused with that annoying Japanese beetle. So definitely keep in mind that there are ways to attract the ladybugs. And they ladybugs eat aphids, they eat white flies, and then they also eat the Colorado potato beetles. So instead of scra- uh, squishing the Colorado potato beetle, you can have ladybugs. Now, William Moss is coming on to Bob in the hour, and he will talk about beneficial insects with him because at his community garden, they're going to re- have a beneficial insect release this afternoon in Chicago. So we're going to ask him about uh, some of that and uh, how to, how to, what his tips are on bringing them in. Right. So with ladybugs, one thing you can do is you can, they're attracted to dill, dandelions, uh, fern, ferns and then a plant called basket of gold so don't kill your don't do that weed and feed with your dandelions right uh leave those and that also feeds the bees that's the first pollen or the first food that the bees are able to uh gather in the uh the spring but yeah ladybugs yeah you can mail order these you can release them well, there is some challenges well, talk, about, talk about maybe why you don't why you would rather attract them than as opposed to purchasing them and trying to keep them around. Okay. So you can release them. You can buy them on online services and they fifteen hundred for a couple of dollars. But you'd want to bring them in because they're native to your area. If you release them and do it properly, yes, some will hang around your garden. But again, they're not all gonna hover that the fifteen hundred around your garden till the end of the season. They're going to explore the environment. If you bring them in, they will see that there's there's food there. There's an environment there in which they can live, and they will hang around your garden. And that's one way in which you can benefit uh, bringing natives in rather than buying and purchasing natives and, and putting in your garden. Right. So one way that we mentioned is buy the different um, those different plants and flowers. Now, one, let's go to the next one here because this one, it's called a ground beetle. It's not, to, to the common ordinary individual, it looks like a bad bug. It looks like, well, it's something you don't want in your house. I, I would assume for most people they would try to extract it. It is a black, uh, multi-legged antenna. Ground, it looks like a beetle. looks like a beetle, right. right. Uh, it, it preys on slugs, caterpillars, ca- the, the California or the Colorado potato beetle, again, and cutworms. Cutworms are those insects that gnaw the plant down like a chainsaw, the seedlings, at the early portions of the growing season or during the, the seedling stage. Right. So they are attracted to one easy flower here to grow is the amaranthus and then also clover. And a lot of us have clover. Native white clover. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you can also purchase that, I believe, at migardener.com, uh, the white clover. But, yeah, that's that's a, a native bug that you can have and you may already have in your garden. And if you're not seeing a whole lot of pest problems, you're not seeing aphids on your plants or the Colorado potato beetle eating your – stuff like that, you've probably already got these beneficial insects. And, and a lot of these bugs, good bugs, are not going to introduce themselves to you in the garden. They're going to do their native hide during the day and feed in the evening, that type of thing. They're not going to make themselves aware because that's not the characteristics of these insects to, hey, everybody, I'm right here because there are predators that feed on them. Right. So also um, you want, one thing to also attract these good bugs is to take a shallow dish – you can put like a layer of small rocks or pebbles, add water to cover about the bottom half of these rocks, and then you put that on the ground or on your garden, and the insects will come and they'll drink from it. That will also help the bees because right. they can land on the rock. They don't drown mm-hmm. as well as birds, and right. that will also kind of decrease the opportunity that the birds will peck holes in your tomatoes because they're having a water source available. And you can, I mean, you can make that. 
you know, real simple or real pretty. You right. could use different, like, decorative rocks. Or and when whatnot. you do that, be sure you check on that because the water evaporates and you need that water in there. And again, we're supposed to be very, very warm this week. If you have plants in containers or in the ground, don't forget about them because by Tuesday or Wednesday next week, you will have very nice dead plants. So be sure you water. That's You just got to do that. I know it's a, a common sense thing, but I, I want to remind people because we have to remind ourselves, hey, we've got containers. We've got to remember to water them uh, on our own garden and, and hanging baskets so that's another thing and then beneficial insects also like ground cover Um, during the day they can they usually will need protection especially during warm days like we're gonna even if you just bust them uh, dry grass clippings some shredded leaves uh, uh, some straw some shredded paper just something that they can get underneath and and supply some of their uh, needs of uh, coolness uh, on that what's another one Um, another one is a green lace wing and I've seen these, if you're not familiar with them, I'm sure you've seen them, you don't realize So it. They're, these are native to Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah. And so they eat aphids, uh, white flies, leaf hoppers, and mealybugs. And they are attracted by dill, um, angelica, and coriander, and golden marguerite. So uh, the common thing seems to be that dill does attract good bugs. But dill is, but very, dill is invasive. very invasive. Yeah. So you may that's something you may want to put near your garden. In a container, and then before it goes to seed, right. catch it, because otherwise you're going to end up with a lot of dill. A lot of dill that you don't want that continues to come back and takes years to get rid of it. Uh, let's go another one. What's another one here that we can uh, hammer? The Bracketon, Bracketon wasp. Let's talk about that one, because people may not be familiar with the remnants that it once was there once they see what happens to the tomato hornworm. Right. So you may not see the bracketed wasp necessarily, but you might see... It's little cocoons. And so say you have a tomato hornworm, which is a type of caterpillar, that those that's what eats your tomatoes, and they're these green, um, kind of long but chubby. Inch to two inch in, inch two in two length yeah, with, probably, a no, half, about three inches. with a half inch horn that right. curves. Yeah, so they, the bracketed wasp will use that them as a host. So if you find this little green guy with these little white cocoons, probably about a, these cocoons are probably about a millimeter tall, all over it, that means that the the tomato hornworm is pretty much dead and the bracket of wasp is now the using eggs, it. The eggs are feeding off right. the internal portions of the tomato hornworm. And those worm. wasps also do eat, um, they also eat aphids as well. So they eat the bad caterpillars and things of that sort and they eat the aphids. Uh, We've got time for one more. Let's get and you can attract them by using lemon balm, parsley, and then yarrow. Okay. Well, one more. What do we got here? Beneficial insects in your garden. And, and these are just a small list. There's dozens upon dozens, and we just picked some of the more uh, familiar ones to have in your garden. Is uh, I guess instead of picking, um, instead of picking one, okay. we can also talk about how it's important to also, you know, talk to your neighbors. If you're in a, a close, you have close neighbors that you want to explain to them about them spraying chemical pesticides. And why why you want to track the good bugs, and why build you're a relationship, kind of build a relationship, and say, hey, I understand you you like this, and you want your lawn to look perfect. That's great. However, um, maybe there's a better time of day for them to to spray that. And stuff some people will, like and, and and on that topic, there some people will spray chemicals on the windiest day. They don't care because they're thinking the job is getting completed. Even in big ag industry, the major chemical. Distri- sprayers the, in big farm, uh, farmers will hire corporations to come in and spray. That's these corporations' job. That's all that they do all summer long, spray these herbicides and pesticides. If the wind is exceeding a certain mile per hour, they will not spray. That's they're part of their requirement right. for the for – the, Well, then uh, also the difference is, is that if you're spraying it and it's above 70 degrees – it can affect it them. Can, it, it doesn't necessarily even cling to the plants. It actually just floats around in the air. So and that's, and people breathe them in. Your pets right. bring them in, uh, breathe it in. Your kids breathe it in, and it's uh, bad for everybody. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, a topic in which we all can participate in, no matter if we live in an apartment, uh, b- uh, anywhere, a house, uh, a rental property. We're going to talk about composting and how simple it is to do right after this. Never miss a thing. Sign up for the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener newsletter. Go to the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and click on the newsletter box.
The international food selection at Woodman's is more than just salsa and soy sauce. We stock a huge selection of foods and ingredients from all over the world. Whether it's Asian, Latin American, European, or Middle Eastern, Woodman's has it. Plus, each store has its own unique selection. With Woodman's, you don't need to visit multiple stores to get what you need. We have everything you need under one roof and at a great price. Do you want your next raised beds to be easy, functional, and beautiful? The Embrace helps you create the garden you've always wanted. Finally, raised beds that everyone can assemble and enjoy. No tools needed. Just slide any lumber into the Embrace corner, fill with your favorite soil mix, and you're ready to plant. Made from 100% recycled steel right here in the USA. And a portion of every sale helps to build school and community gardens all across the country. Let the Embrace help you create your next raised bed. Grow beautiful. Beautifully with the Embrace. Available at local garden centers and online at artofthegarden.net. Hot Shed Mill, 125 years of experience producing stone, ground, organic flour and cornmeal made from premium quality whole grains. Family owned company. Continual standards that are non GMO, organic at the highest safety levels. Offering a wide variety of flours, pasta, baking mixes, flaxseed, and more. Even kosher and gluten free options. Found at most local grocers like Woodman's. For more information, and recipes, visit hotshinmill.com. That's H-O-D-G-S-O-N-M-I-L-L.com. The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, rootmaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants, to multiple-gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. Rootmaker.com has your grow needs covered. Visit Rootmaker.com. Hi, I'm John Lewandowski, retail manager of Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. Now, I'm not going to tell you about our awesome dome-grown plants, our beautiful pottery, or our 40 varieties of landscape materials. What I am going to tell you is that Blue Mel's is a local, independent, family-owned garden center that truly cares about your garden or landscape project. So if you're looking for that one garden center that actually cares about you, Come to Blue Mel's Garden and Landscape Center. We've been treating our customers like family since 1955. Blue Mel's 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show right here on WNOV. 860 AM and W293CX106.5. The dot com is your destination for all things gardening. Over 900 garden-related video, short and long format, all to help you. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram's all there as well. Go and explore. Let us know what you think and let us know how you found out about the show. Oh, briefly, uh, we want to welcome those who are tuning in for the very first time because they saw us in The Shepherd this past week. Uh, we're happy to have you along, and feel free to contact us any way, form, shape. Uh, if you've got a gardening question, we're more than happy to help you out with your garden problems. And uh, to helping us out with fresh produce, peaches, that is, coming right to our neighborhood, treeripe.com can do that for us. If you like fresh produce delivered right to your neighborhood, you should check out Tree Ripe Citrus Company. They have beautiful, top-quality produce from tree-ripe.com. They have beautiful, tasty peaches, sweet, juicy blueberries. If you're sick of bland, milly peaches and lackluster blueberries from our local grocer, Tree Ripe has what you need. They come right to a stop in your neighborhood, fresh off the truck, right from the source. For location and schedules, visit tree-ripe.com. They have locations all over, including Iowa, Upper and Lower Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, and right here in Wisconsin. Tree-ripe.com is your go-to for the freshest produce around. I got an email from this, them this morning. Yeah. I didn't look at it. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but, but yeah. we keep saying how luscious and great they are, and it's hard. We could stand, use a lot of adjectives to describe how right. wonderful it is, and it's one of those things you have to uh, uh, you have to experience. And last year they actually so you, they didn't so that you didn't have to buy like a, a half bushel. They were setting up and selling smaller portions at different farmers markets. I don't know if they're doing that this year. That might have been what the email was about. I didn't really okay. look at it, but we'll have to keep you informed. Okay. Well, let's talk about composting. It's a simple task that everybody can f- perform, and we, it doesn't take a whole lot of effort. No. It can be simple, and then it can be more complicated or scientific, I guess, is one of the things you could say. And so the first ca- type of composting I want to talk about is called the anaerobic con- composting. 
Okay. Let's, so this let's is like the, that for this us. is like the the um, I want to compost, but I don't want to put a lot of thought into it. Composting. Simple composting. Simple composting. Okay. Right. It's also known as cold composting, which is what we perform. Right. Which is what we perform. Now there are some good and bads, so and one of the goods is that you don't have to overthink it. You just put your food scraps or your leaves, your weeds, your yard waste in it but however if the yard waste is diseased or has possible chemicals sprayed on it or um yeah so either of those you don't want to put that in there but the disadvantage to the cold composting is you don't have the internal temperature that heats up that kills the seed uh the viability in the seed which we'll talk about in a moment in the hot composting and with co- with composting in general based on where you're located there's certain things you don't want to put in your compost and certain places your compost cannot be Right, so you might have to, you might live in an area where compost has to be off the ground or in a contained container, or you might have the possibility of pests. So if you live in the country on 35 acres, you don't have to necessarily worry about that. And, and it's away from your residence. You can throw bones, meat, grease, whatever you want in that pile. If you're in the city, you want to avoid dairy, uh, meats, meat, greases, bones. all that. because You could attract pests. It, you're, you're, and that's the main thing. You're, you're going to attract pests. It will eventually break down. But the odor and the uh, uh, invitation of uh, insects, animals that you don't want will come and then your property will be the most popular place in the neighborhood. And it does stink. Uh, cold composting s- does not smell good. Right. I mean, not not all the time, but on really hot days or if you kind of mix it up or it, whatever, it's going to smell. So then we have aerobic composting, which is the process of it getting hot. And it's also known as hot composting. And you're using um, the balance of science to work for you. Uh, Carbon and nitrogen, browns and greens, the uh, recommendation is about 50% of each type of material. Browns can be shredded paper, dry grass clippings. Or no, not dry grass clippings. uh, That that would be a a nitrogen source. Uh, Shredded leaves, straw. Uh, any type of brown material, cardboard. I mean, some people have glues, but sticks. Sticks, yeah. yeah. Uh, nice. Some people believe the glue has a toxicity. Um, I go ahead and throw it in there anyway. And the nitrogen sources can be greens of any sort, uh, kitchen scraps, coffee. Use coffee grounds is considered a nitrogen source. Though uh, the the grass clippings, and then together there's a science that occurs where it heats up internally. And it can get 150, 160 degrees, 170 degrees inside of the internal portions. And the repetitive of turning the compost, some people believe, accelerates the compost process. Some people will just allow that internal portions to heat up. But the the, the downside to that is if you don't mix it, you don't get the outer portions internally to kill the viability off on those weed seeds, which is... 72 hours of at least 150 degrees Fahrenheit to get those seeds not to or to bake them basically and kill the germination uh, germination of those seeds and that's crucial if you're going to distribute that compost back in your, your garden if you don't have those weed seeds killed you're going to reintroduce those weed seeds into your garden and you're back at square one right. what we do because we cold compost we will take that compost and put it the bottom quarter to a third in our containers and then pour fresh certified leaf compost on top of them and smother out and just add it as a, use it as a filler for our containers. So that's how we stretch our store-bought compost with our homemade compost, simply because we just don't turn it, and that's a choice that we have chosen to make. Right. So then there's also verma composting, or some people for short call it verma, verma posting. And that is where you have the oxygen and moisture present, but you're using worms to break down the compost. You can create your own vermicompost or worm bin in your house and allow your kitchen scraps and you grind them up or based on what type of ingredients. There are certain things that worms don't care much for, which is like citrus skins, orange skins, but sm- uh, small amounts of that introduced can use, uh, they'll feed off that. And you can buy these worms online. And the nice thing about the worm compost, it's very rich in nutrients, but the worms will only populate or reproduce to the point where they know that they, the the bin is too full. Let's say you have a 30-gallon Rubbermaid tote, 
and there's ways that you can make this or you can purchase one. Once the worms sense that they are out of room, they will stop reproducing. And you can divide them and create another bin or sell them or give them away. That type. But you don't – these are special worms. You don't want to take these worms and put in your garden. These are most of the time considered – called red wigglers, which are a worm that is very uh, – that will eat the compost very regularly, very rapidly. Right. So the, the red worms eat uh, pretty much anything. And then, so that's that's. Why. You don't want to put your bones and grease and, right. and oils in there because there, that will kill the worms. But there are other worms that are just going to eat, um, maybe just what they like. Right. And, and so, but the red worms do eat pretty much everything, and they also eat the microbes. And then what the worm castings is what is what is also beneficial, which is basically worm poop. Right. And you can use that worm castings as top dressing or sprinkle on top of the pots that your po- your plants are growing in inside or outdoors. And you can save some stuff going to landfill. You can have a little, you know, uh, fun thing for the, if you have kids or just to, you know, make yourself feel good because you're doing something positive and for the environment. And when you do this, you want to, you just don't want to take a handful of worms and toss them in your compost heap. No, no. You're going to have to make basically a worm bin, or you can buy a worm bin. But either way, um, you can make one pretty easy with like a Rubbermaid type container, a large Rubbermaid container. There's plenty of videos yeah, online. There's a lot of videos. And there's online. very nice ones that you can purchase as well. Oh well, yeah, you can buy them too, but you can also make them. Right, right, and that's the thing. So you know, you, you however you compost, wherever you compost, uh, the recommended. And again, when I say recommended, I'm talking about the people online, and you can take that for however serious you want to. The recommended size of an outdoor compost pile is one cubic yard, which is three foot by three foot by three foot cube or three whatever that is, uh, 20, 27 cubic feet. That's an awful large compost pile for most urban garden backyards. You don't have to have it that big. As long as you follow the recommended rates uh, and do some research online, just don't take our word for it. Go out and throw some junk on a pile in the backyard. Do a little research because it makes your life a whole lot better and disappointment a whole lot less whenever you decide to try any of the projects you see online or uh, you, you hear from us on the program here. So is that all the composting that we want to cover? There's other composting uh, practices, but I wanted to cover those are the main. Those are the main. Those three. are the main three, and I think that if you want to go anything beyond that, you would definitely have to do uh, some research. But that's basically what it comes down and, to. And again, ground or in a trash can. With a trash can, we have a 30-gallon trash can with holes, plastic, uh, drilled multiple, hun- uh, lots of holes, dozens of holes to allow the oxygen to get in there, so it's off the ground, so it's not physically on the ground, or and it's enclosed to where you can keep critters out of it. Well, when it comes to taking pride in your property, as we talked about earlier in the program, one is mowing your grass and doing it regularly and doing it with a piece of equipment that you know will get the job done and get it done right. Do you hear that? That's your neighbor shaking in their grass-stained shoes because Aaron's is about to help you step up your grass-cutting game. Your name is on the mailbox, so the Aaron's name should be on your mower. Heavy-duty steel construction, smarter, smoother controls. Professional cutting performance. The only thing we love more than the smell of freshly cut grass is the sweet taste of victory. Aaron's, it comes down to this. Visit Aaron's.com to find your local dealer for lawn and snow removal equipment. When we come back, horticultural educator and uh, TV guru, William Moss will be with us right after this. Tweet Joey and Holly using hashtag TWVG. What you say? You say nasala kombucha. It'll put some glide in your stride and some pep in your step. Nasala kombucha. <laughs> yeah. Nasala kombucha makes your body happy. Nasala kombucha makes your body smile. You have a little space to grow? Check out Greenstock Vertical Gardens at greenstockgarden.com. Greenstock is engineered to grow with its innovative space and water-saving design. You can grow vegetables, flowers, herbs, and even strawberries in just two square feet of space. Grow up instead of out. Perfect for the porch, patio, or deck. Grow up to 30 plants in a small space. Greenstockgarden.com has everything you need to grow in the littlest of spaces. 
proudly made in the USA. For more information and to purchase, visit GreenStockGarden.com. Beans and Barley Marketing Cafe, a neighborhood specialty grocery store for the east side of the greater Milwaukee area, where you can find all you need from fresh produce to bakery to organic frozen dinners, from wine to fresh squeezed carrot juice. The health food stores hundreds of products, vitamin supplements, bath and body items, magazines, cars, books, and a knowledgeable staff. Catering available, open daily at 8 a.m. The restaurant serves breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week with a menu of good, healthy, homemade food, including vegetarian and non vegetarian specialties. 1901 East North Avenue, Milwaukee, 414 and online at beansandbarley.com. Mycorrhizae is a beneficial fungus from PlantSuccess.com that will greatly increase your plant's germination, ability, and a healthier root structure. You can increase seed sprouting, root growth, and general plant germination. Mycorrhizae can be used with hydroponics, root cutting, seed sprouting, coca core, and soil. PlantSuccess.com carries powder, granule, and tablet forms of mycorrhizae. Increase the level of mycorrhizae in your soil for your plants to give them the optimal opportunity to produce an incredible harvest. For more information and to purchase, visit PlantSuccess.com. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show with your hosts, Joey and Holly Baird. It is the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show on 860 AM WNOV and W2936 106.5. So happy you have joined us today tuning in. Uh, moments away, William Moss will be with us. About 15 minutes away, your calls on the IVOrganics.com hotline, as well as the official garden center, the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show, Blue Mills. They have a lot of native plants there. They still have a lot of vegetables there. They've got fertilizer. They've got landscaping. Everything you need for your property, they have. Yeah, Blue Mills Garden Landscape Center is just that place. They have a very knowledgeable staff. The owner works right in the building. They've been around since 1955. No matter the size of your garden need, Blue Bells at 4930 West Limits Road in Greenfield can supply and surpass, surpass all of your garden needs. You can go to bluemills.com or call 414-282-4220. If you've never been there, they've got an enclosed playground for your children or grandchildren so they can play safely. And it's got that rubber stuff so you can you know bounce off of it and you're not going to get hurt while you look at the plants and, and the landscape material. they got everything that you need, and it's a great and place. And they have a coffee shop. Coffee shop, yeah. yeah. If you've never been there, take take 15 minutes uh, and go there. It, it's a great place. Well, Holly, let's go to the ivyorganics.com hotline and bring our next guest. Let's go to Chicago, Illinois. Master gardener, horticultural expert, media expert, and all-around great guy. On very, He's on various media, media platforms. He explains how to grow sustainably and have gardening success through TV, radio, print presentations, and workshops. He uses gardening and greening to inspire people to get out and grow. Welcome to the program, William Moss. Hello. Wow, that's a nice intro. Well, we appreciate you taking time. I know you've got some activities going on at the community garden here. Uh, in just a little while, but we're glad you took some time to join Holly, myself, and our listeners to share a little bit of your garden knowledge with all of us. Well, this is long overdue, and, and, and you know, when I hear you guys talking about beneficial insects, it lets me know I'm on the right track. <laughs> Well, let's talk about uh, people use all kinds of tools in the in the garden. We don't till, so we don't have a tiller, but that's not we're not discriminatory towards people who do. But shovels, uh, garden forks, all that. What is some basic tool maintenance as people need to uh, follow right now and even at the end of the season uh, when it comes to maintaining your your tools that you have? Well, the best thing to do when it comes to maintaining tools is to, is to do it do a little bit at a time. So, you know, don't, don't try to wait until the end of the year or your tool will be in too bad a shape. So the simplest trick you can do is to get you a bucket of sand. This is a, a five-gallon bucket. Fill it up with some, with some nice clay sand or, or even with some haven sand. You just need sand. And then every time you finish using your garden fork or your trowel or the shovel, you take that and just dump it down into that bucket. And the sand adds like a brillo pad and scrubs off a lot of things on it. Then you just take a little brush and brush it clean. The cleaner you keep your shovel, the sharper it will be. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a simplest trick I can say. That keeps it nice and clean. And then you can, at the end of the season, then you can get into the sharpening your tools and all of that. And, you know, just like in the kitchen, a, a, a properly maintained piece of equipment is a lot safer, too. Same thing with the, the garden tools. Definitely. It, it's, a lot, it's a lot safer, it, it, and it does the trick a lot better. You do the work. I mean, I won't say how, how much faster depends on how fast you work, but you'll definitely do your work faster with a sharper shovel or a sharper pair of pruners. And when it comes to pruning, now you do want to sharpen those 
if you can chop it at least once a month during the season, you keep your cut, your, your cut clean, and then you'll have less chance to spread disease or less chance to cause damage by leaving a piece that's hanging on that gets infected or gets or bite some sort of pet. So sharp pruners all the time. Now, now you don't have to sharpen your shovel every month. But you should definitely sharpen your pruners once a month. Now, some people will go ahead and coat them with a uh, commercial-grade uh, oil that uh, people might use on automotive equipment. Uh, that's not really the best thing when it comes to actually using that on plants and soil that you're growing your food in, is it? It is not the best thing. Now, people have used it, and that tip was out there for years. Just use some old mortar oil and a bucket of sand and dip it in there, and it makes it not only clean, but makes it shiny, too. I don't prefer that. I prefer using, uh, you know, for my vegetable garden, which typically is organic, you know, I, I, I try to keep everything in it nice and clean. I prefer to use either a horticultural oil or, you know, I'll use like an olive oil or like a corn oil or something like that um, to help sharpen and polish them up. Because I know that way, if it's suitable for my, for my ingestion, then it shouldn't be bad anything for my plants. Now, many people are still planting tomatoes here and other other parts of the Midwest. What is the biggest mistake people make when planting tomatoes? Well, I mean, tomatoes are the most popular homegrown veggie on the planet. So the, the uh, list of mistakes is uh, is um, encyclopedic. But, <laughs> but, I'll, but I'll, just, I'll just say a couple of them. Number one is they plant them too shallow, I would say, uh, because, because tomatoes are one of the few plants, few vegetable plants that we grow that are capable of making ac- tissues roots along the stem. Take advantage of that. Plant it deeper. The more roots you have, the more production that you will have. So don't plant the plant shallow. Put it deep. I know everyone always tells you, keep, you know, plant the plant at the same soil line it had when it was in the pot. That's true for 90-something percent of plants. That is not true for tomatoes. You can plant it deep and give it a much better chance to establish itself. So that's probably the number one mistake they make. Number two is they water unevenly. Uh, you know, they'll come out, they'll water very heavily on a Sunday, and then maybe they'll sprinkle through the week or whatever, or, or just or just count that one heavy water when they get them through. Tomatoes like like even watering. So, you know, they don't want to be wet all the time. They don't want to go through a bone drop phase. You can keep them nice and even. Then their root that has a taste, the, um, the well, root I- able to get the calcium out the soil that they need, and you won't have as much blossom in box. Right. Uh, we talked about, and you, we talked about the beneficial insects in the first segment of the program, and you've got a project going on at uh, the community garden here in a couple of, a little bit. Explain what you're doing and, and why you're doing it, just to solidify our conversation we had earlier on the program. Well, uh, most community gardens here in the Chicagoland area are, um, well, they try to be pesticide free, or at least chemical free is what they try to be because you don't know what the next person is using, and we try not to use many. So um, so pests can get a chance to get a hold. Uh, in most garden situations, you need to have a balance between between good bugs and bad bugs, and in a lot of artificial spaces, especially in an urban area, you know, we're sometimes totally lacking the good bugs. The bad bugs come in, uh, you know, with the plant when you buy it, or they fly over from, from some field or something, and then they get in there, and they can really wreak havoc. So... Aphids are one of those things that when they come in and find a garden, especially, like I said, when it's in the city and not really surrounded by a lot of natural area, they can get out of hand really fast. So by adding things like ladybugs and lace wings, we kind of help restore the balance. Now, if, now, now if you're way out somewhere where you've got woodlands around, you may have those creatures naturally come into your garden, but we don't. So, that, so we have to bring in ladybugs. We also bring in lace wings. Dragonflies also can do the trick. We're, we're near Lake Michigan. Dragonflies can kill. But the problem with dragonflies is they are indiscriminate killers, and they'll kill anything that moves in the garden. I mean, <laughs> lace wings and ladybugs would at least stay um, and eat the aphids. They'll stay around for a while and eat the aphids. So what we do every year is we come out and we bring the, you know, we tell the kids to come on out, and we get a bunch of ladybugs donated to us by Orcon, and they come out with their own containers. Kids poke holes and do get some milk jugs or whatever. When we give them some later bugs to take home to release in their garden, at the same time we release them in our community gardens when they spread out and take care of the pests. That's great. Now, many people choose to grow in containers. There are many advantages to growing in containers. How, first of all, how does one know what size to c- container to grow in for their planting? And is there one type of pot good for different material types, like maybe flowers should go in a certain pot versus vegetables, things like that? 
Oh, gracious, Holly. That is a question I teach courses on. I will try to run through it quickly. Um, um, basically, for me, when I grow fruits and vegetables, terracotta, stone, uh, ceramic, all those pots are a no-no because I have broken them so many times. They look beautiful, but the problem is you have to dig around in them. You know, you bang the trowel against the side and you can break them. Or if you're growing root pots like potatoes or sweet potatoes, and you turn them over, they can easily break or snap. So, you know, I have spent, I have wasted too much money on fostering, uh, you know, busting them up to ever do that again. So now I grow all my vegetables inside of plastic and those, and those, uh, HDR or, or, or like resinous pots that they have. They look fantastic. I mean, you can get these, these new, these new, um, pots that look almost like ceramic, but they are ceramic. They're plastic or fiberglass or some sort of structure like that. They can take them and bang with your shovel. You can dig around in them if you have to. You can dump them out to get, to get the contents out of them. It's easy to change the soil over with them. They weigh a whole lot less. So for me, I always say I would start with a pot that is plastic or some sort of plastic composite. And for vegetables, it has to be at least 15 inches in diameter for me. Uh, that gives me enough root run to grow everything from eggplants to tomatoes, um, you know, to, 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 to small squash and things like that. Now, once you start talking about some plants are just not great for containers, like okra, pumpkins, they're, they're too big to really do well in containers. And okra has a really deep cap root. I know okra's not really a popular crop here in the Midwest, but I'm telling you, if, if you take nothing else from what I'm saying today, all your listeners, if you take nothing else, grow okra. It's an incredible plant with a beautiful flower, but it needs a ground space, not a, not a, not a container. So, you know, for most people, if you're growing regular, average vegetable crops, a 15-inch plastic composite container can look beautiful and do the trick. Well, it's great information, and the larger the container, the more soil mass, the slower it has the opportunity to dry out, too, and that's something we always preach as well. That is, that, that is definitely true. The larger the container, the, the more mass it has to hold soil, and the more roots you get, and the more roots you get, the more production you get up top. I've grown tomatoes in a 12-inch container, a 15-inch container, and a 22-inch container. By far, the 22-inch container gave more tomatoes. So, you know, the larger you go, the better. So bigger is better in most cases. <laughs> now, you talk to people all the time, and we as well, and, and one of the questions or one of the comments we get is, oh, I can't grow anything. I've got a black thumb. Well, what are some good house plant maintenance tips that you can offer people who think that they can't grow anything? Well, it's also plant selection. You know, people people think they can't grow anything, but there are plants that can grow inside your house that need almost nothing from you. Select those. Start there first. And usually when people say they can't grow something, that means that they either neglected it too much or, in most cases, gave it too much love. That's usually the problem. They wanted it too much. So start with plants like, like low-light plants that don't need much water, like a cast iron plant or a mother-in-law tongue or a pasto, something like that. Choose one of those plants that, that don't need much from you, and then make it make it plain. Sunday's my day to water. That's it. You don't water any other day. You water it on Sunday, and you water it, and, and then you ask, or you go online, or you call into a show like yours and ask how much water. Like if someone were to ask me how much water to give to a status of iron, which is a mother-in-law plant, I would say give it a cup every Sunday. Just a cup of water every Sunday. And you, you, you set that in your mind that Sunday is your watering day, and then you don't do anything else all during the week for that plant. But usually what happens is people forget when they water, so they're water extra or water more, and they rot the roots out on that plant. So start with plant selection. Get you a plant that doesn't need much, doesn't need much light, doesn't need much water, doesn't need much care. And then you make one day to maintain that plant, and then you'll find that it's easy to have a green thumb or easy to start cultivating that green thumb. But once you have this plant that does well, you may want to up the challenge to try something else. So uh, but start with those easy-to-grow plants, cast iron, mother-in-law's tongue, things like that. Don't start with succulents because people always say, well, cactus should be easy. You know, I'll grow a cactus. But cactus requires a lot of light, and the watering schedule can be a little tricky. Uh, you know, you don't want to give them much at all. So I would say start with something even simpler, a low-light plant, a low-light, easy-to-grow plant, and then go from there. Let me give one more tip if I can, guys. Yeah, go ahead. 
so uh, you know, I wanted to talk about the tomatoes again. Tomatoes are, are near and dear to my heart. So one tip that I have found about tomatoes, and I found this out recently. I've grown tomatoes in containers for 20 years now and in the ground for more than that. But one thing I found out about them is that there's a big, huge growth spurt of tomatoes right about now, from June through May, July. That's when tomatoes get really rank and their growth just goes nuts. Then they'll start to set a bunch of flowers and you get fruit all throughout. If you, like most people, need to reduce some of that rank growth, need to cut it back or pinching out suckers. So rather than pinching out my suckers, which, which was what I was taught to do when I, when I first learned to do this, what I do now is I let everything just grow crazy for a couple of weeks and then go in and collectively prune out entire branches of the tomato to bring it back into shape. Now, what you do with those pruned out branches, because you'll have some that'll be two feet long, three feet long, four feet long, what you do with those is you replant them. And what I have found, what happens is, you put them in the ground, deep to at least a foot down. What I found what happens is, the uh, mother plant will flower and fruit, and a couple of weeks later, all those offspring that you cut off and put in the ground will start to flower and fruit. So what you'll have is, almost a continual chain of harvest. You'll be able to harvest everything and have a big flush from the mother plant. Then all those babies that you stuck in the ground somewhere and put out will do the same thing again. And that way I've really learned to extend my harvest and get a lot more. So rather than starting six sun gold tomato plants, I only start two sun gold tomato plants now and I cut off four big branches to give me six by the end of the year. Makes it easier to start them, easier to get them growing. And when you put those big branches in the ground, you're guaranteed success. So that's my tomato tip of the day. Well, William, we greatly appreciate you taking time out of your busy day to join us and our listeners. For people who want to venture over and find out more information about you and the uh, all the stuff that you're doing, how can people find you? Um, I have a website, Get Out and Grow. So you type in getoutandgrow.com. I also have a .org domain, too. And please come check out my Facebook page. That's the one that's managed the most. Uh, Facebook at williammosstv.com. Well, William, thank you very much. Thank and, you, William. And a lot of great information that we can all take and use in our garden every day. Well, thank you guys so much for having me, and I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. And we'll be back right after this with your garden questions and our garden answers. A gardening question? You can call into the ivorganic.com hotline at 414-444-5250 right now. Garden seeds do not have to cost a fortune. Just 99 cents at migardener.com. With over 300 varieties of non-GMO, heirloom and organic, flower, vegetable and herb seeds, Available year-round, pay less and get more seeds. Shipping as low as $2.50. That just makes sense. Go to migardener.com for seeds and gardening needs, tools and special blend fertilizer. migardener.com. It's that simple. Family owned and operated. Mantis Plant Protection Professional Grade Organic Pest Control Solutions. They offer Mantis EC concentrated or ready to use sprays. Certified organic and environmentally friendly insect killer. Gentle on pollinators and other organisms, but effective in killing soft bodied insects and spider mites fast. Safe around your children and pets. They also have the cleanest and whitest diatomaceous earth on the market. Visit MantisPP.com to receive a free organic pesticide cheat sheet, which is a list of organic insecticides that are used effectively and kill kills insects fast. Visit mantispp.com to download it today. Do you have a problem with deer or small herbivores eating your vegetation? There is a natural solution that is safe for your pets and family. Bobex is the answer. An environmentally friendly solution to protect your plants will not wash off and is guaranteed. Bobex deer was independently tested against nine known competitors and rated 93% effective, second only to a physical barrier. Bobex can be used on all types of ornamentals, trees, and shrubs. Ask for it by name at your local independent garden center. Find out more? Visit bobex.com. B O B B. I want a garden center that listens to and understands my needs. I want to buy my gardening products from a local business with strong ties to the community. All I want is a garden center that truly values their customers. It seems like everyone is selling plants these days, but I'm having a hard time finding quality. I take pride in my garden, so I want my garden center to take pride in their products. Where will you be going for all of your gardening needs this season? Blue Mel's Garden Center. 
We are your answer. Blue Mouse 4930 West Loomis Road, 414-282-4220. Now back to the Wisconsin Vegetable Garden Radio Show. Because thinking isn't knowing. I know most tomatoes can be red. I know radishes take 32 days to reach maturity. I don't. I, I think I might know where that under thinking isn't knowing. With your host Joey Kelly. It's the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. The Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. Your destination for all things gardening. Nine hundred plus videos, digital magazines, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and a whole lot more. Well, let's jump to the ivyorganics dot com hotline and bring in. We've got a question there. Caller, you're on the air. What is your question? Yes, uh, I had a neighbor that said. When you're composting with newspaper, that you should never use the ones with the colored inks because it kills off the worms and it's a poison. A lot. Well, th- that would have been true a couple of decades ago. The ink now is all soy-based uh, or, or more organically based. You can use that. What I would avoid in the, in the worm bin is the paper that has the glossy coating on it. Uh, because that has like that's like a plastic film, and that's not going to work well for the worms. But anything that has just a pure paper, paper is fine. Okay, okay. And I was I had another question, but I forgot. <laughs> well, thank okay. thank you for calling in. Thank you okay. for listening. Thank you. Well, the IBOrganics.com hotline is open for you with your questions at 414-444-5250. And IBOrganics.com is what, Holly? It's a three-in-one plant card that naturally protects plants against damaging sunburn, insects, and rodents, protects newly installed plants and trees, shields pruned and damaged surfaces for use on your roses, fruit and nut trees, ornamental trees, and shrubs. This product is non-toxic, environmentally safe, and organic. For more information, visit IVOrganics.com, and that's 414-444-5250. And if you've got a question during the week when we're not on the air, twvgradio at gmail.com, or you can just go to the website, thewisconsinvegetablegardener.com, and you can find a big contact button there, and you can certainly do that. Um, we had a number of questions come in this week with uh, on uh, the, the website, TWVG Radio, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, well, we have a number of questions come in uh, on the ivyorganics.com hotline, uh, uh, on uh, email, and uh, let's go through a couple of questions. Oh, we have another caller on the air. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, I was just wondering, I have empty lots. Okay. How do you get an empty lot that's in the community, that's in between maybe a few houses, a couple of houses? Well, what you want to do, okay, what you want to do is find out who your alderman is and then find out through him or through the alderman office whose property that currently is. If the city owns that or, okay, you, you own it. Okay. So what you need to do is contact the city and find out from them if they will allow you to go to the steps of putting a community garden in or a, 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 your, your own garden, whether it's by uh, raised beds or ground. So you, regardless of, uh, you need to ask permission because if you're going to go to the work and putting a garden in on property between, uh, on, a, on a vacant lot, you want to make sure you have all the, red, all the green lights to go before you put the effort in and they make you take it out for a variety of uh, unreasonable un, uh, reasons. But uh, I would go with the city. You may are it's fenced off. It's what now? It's fenced off. I fenced it off. Okay. Um, well, I would it's make sure. It's fenced off. I mean, it's just, I mean, but, you know, I'm cutting the grass. Right. Okay. Um, well, I would just make sure with the, the city, that or your, your ordinance, that uh, you're totally fine because some or, some city ordinances only require so much. But uh, I would just check with the, the city and just make sure, hey, if I do this, is is that okay? Because I don't want you to go through the effort, and I tell you to, to go, and then uh, people have problems with it and uh, are not pleased with it and report you. Yeah, well, the neighborhood is sitting there saying, like, if you're going to put a garden there, I mean, we they'd love it. Right. Yeah, I don't I don't live there. Okay. Yeah, you know, I got out of Milwaukee because, like, the earlier caller you just had, yeah, they do drive crazy. <laughs> but, uh, but hey, that's another story. Well, right. we... We yeah. appreciate you calling in with your question. We thank you for listening as well. Thank you for your, being part of the show. All right, let's uh, let's go with um, a couple of questions we got in this week on the uh, email. Uh, let's. Uh, what, what we got, Holly? 
Um, I like this question here. Could I mix up some granule fertilizers in a five-gallon bucket of water to get it into the soil faster to make kind of like a, a fertilizer tea? Okay, that can be, well, there's compost tea, which you can just take compost and create a liquid uh, feed for your plants. You can. I wouldn't recommend a granular fertilizer, even if, if it says soluble, um, that means it will dissolve in water when it rains in the soil, but just by putting it in a bucket and putting granular fertilizer in it and mixing it together, it's just not going to uh, work very well at all. Okay, what's another one here? Oh, here's one. Um, the comment came through through the uh, the website or the the YouTube channel when uh, we were talking about cucumbers a couple of weeks ago, this segment, and it just uh, he meant this in all good favor. Uh, I love your, I love to hear you on the radio. I love to watch your YouTube videos of the in-studio video. But when is Holly's turn to talk? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I am just more quiet, I guess. So um, I, I, Joey just always talks a lot more than I do. So if you do have any questions specifically for me, I would be more than happy to address them. It's just kind of how we are. Joey's the talker, and I'm more of the quiet one. Um, that's common in a lot of relationships. Or maybe not so common. I guess it just depends. But I am I am the more quiet one. So what is... Um we, what is the crown of a strawberry plant? That was a question we had. And the crown is the conjunction of where the leaves extract from the plant and go vertical out of the ground. If you cover your crown of your strawberry plant, it will suffocate it and it will die. So as you see the strawberry plant grow in the container or as it's naturally in the ground, that's the depth in which you want to plant it because if you plant it too deep, it will suffocate and you will not have strawberries. So don't plant that deep at, at all. Well, there's a uh, number of sponsors you hear throughout the program that make this show possible, and we thank them for allowing us to come here each and every week to be with you, to help you with your garden questions, and uh, inform you of things that you can do positively on your property and grow more food. Nacelle Kombucha is the executive sponsor of the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener Radio Show. Nacelle is made in Wisconsin with local tea and natural herbs. Look for it in the refrigerator aisle at your local grocer. If you don't see it, ask for it because if it's not Nacelle Kombucha, it's not kombucha. Find out more at nacelle.com. Coming up next week, well, if you missed any portion of this show or want to revisit past shows, you can find that under the radio tab on our website, the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com. Uh, we've got all the shows and the segments and uh, all that. Uh, next week, uh, join us. We're going to do part three of debunking common garden myths. Uh, way back early in the series this year, we did uh, two segments of it. We've got a number of more common garden myths that we're going to debunk to save you time in the garden. Because why would you do something if there's no scientific proof? that it works, as well as farmer's markets. Have you ever been to one? We're going to tell you everything you need to know before you venture out and uh, go buy some fresh produce from the local farmers, as well as Stacy Torin. She is the author of Plants You Cannot Kill. So that might be an article uh, uh, segment uh, you might want to tune in and let your friends know who you have been told have black thumbs that can't grow anything. It's a great book. Till next week. I'm Holly Baird. And I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden.